to the opening hymn. Gary does announcements. I would like to teach you um, the song that we're going to sing after the Advent candle is lit. So when it comes up, you'll be all ready to do it. So the choir is going to sing through it one time for you, and then you're going to sing it. And Jake's going to put it up on the screen because I didn't tell him. sing with us, right? You may be seated. Hi, I'm Pastor Gary Rideout, one of the co-senior pastors here at uh, St. Andrew's United Methodist Church. And we're so glad you could be here today. I hope you all had a wonderful, uh, blessed Thanksgiving. Glad you could be here today. And for those that are on a live stream, we wish you uh, well, too. And right in that chat space, just say good morning and say who's there on a, uh, in our live stream today. we got a good-looking group here in the sanctuary, so we want to know who's out there, too. So just right out the, right on there at the chat space, who, uh, who, who's visiting with us today, who's watching online. Um, it is the first Sunday in Advent. Uh, Thanksgiving is now over. Now we're going into a season of preparing our hearts and minds for Christmas. Uh, as, as you can see, the um, at least the ones that are here, you can see that the sanctuary is decorated. We had a wonderful hanging of the greens this past Sunday. A lot of you, a lot of you here, a lot of people gathered, stayed afterwards after the service, and decorated, uh, put all the decorations, makes it a very a festive looking sanctuary. I hope you people on live stream can see uh, how how beautiful it is here. We think everyone has done that. I do have a couple of announcements for you. First of all, this. Uh, Weekend this uh, Wednesday is caroling in the courtyard. Uh, it'll be a time for singing, for cookies, for an outdoor showing of a classic, the Charlie Brown Christmas. I've seen it hundreds of times. That I, 
that came out when I was a little kid. That shows you how old it is. But it's still timeless. It's real timeless. And we'll have our annual tree lighting in the courtyard. So register at saumc.life. It's this, again this Wednesday. It starts at 6.30 p.m. And then also, uh, uh, Wednesday is the first day of December, and we'll start our 12 days of giving. And each day, we'll highlight a different mission partner or ministry each day from social media. You can donate to that ministry online, or you can bring it in on the next two Sundays, uh, the donations for each ministry. If you're here, I hope when you got, came in, you got one of these 12 days of giving. And on the back, it will tell you what each day is. Uh, in, in, in December for the 12 days, what you can give from. If you're uh, watching live stream, you can go to our website or the Church Center app and find out what those are. Uh, for more information, go to saumc.life. I also hope if you're here, you got one of these flyers. It will show you the activities we have coming for the Advent season, what events we're having, and you hopefully you grab one. of This is for you, but I hope you grab a few of these uh, on the back, it gives the, the, uh, the Christmas Eve services. Uh, these are for you to pass out to your friends and family to invite them uh, to come to the service. So I hope you grab a few of these on the way out. We got a wonderful worship service today. And um, we're going to start it out each Sunday in Advent. We have a lighting of the Advent candle. We light um, uh, one of the Advent candles. And we've got the uh, Adams family, uh, Jess, Steve, and the two boys are here. And this morning we'll light the first Advent candle, the candle of hope. We light this candle in order to prepare the way of hope. In a world that is often filled with darkness, we remember there is hope that comes from God alone. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness, bringing hope to all and showing us the way of salvation. Please join us for the congregational response. O come, O come, Emmanuel, bring your hope. It's great time. Take a few minutes now to say hello to the people around you. Wave, shake hands, hug. Just be mind, mindful of everyone's comfort level. If you are worshiping online, say hello in the chat space or invite someone to worship this morning by clicking the invite button. We all need some extra love, so if there's someone there that's been on your heart lately, Take some time today to send a quick text to let them know you are thinking about them or give them a call to catch up. Good morning. My name is Jane Rideout. I'm the other um, co-lead pastor, and I am really pleased to be worshiping with you today, whether you are online or you are here in the building. How wonderful it is to begin the Advent season. We're going to move into a time of prayer right now, and our tradition here is that we begin with silent prayer. And that time of silent prayer is twofold. You have the opportunity to quiet your heart because we all come to worship with our own burdens and our own cares. But we also want to open up the altar. So during the silent prayer, if you would like to come forward and kneel, you know, there's some times when it just feels good to physically be in a position to remember that God is God and we are not. So we're going to begin with some silent prayer. Feel free to come forward if you like. And from your seats or from your homes, be sure to just now lift up those personal needs, those things that are very precious to your heart. Let's begin.
Loving God, we are so grateful to be moving into this Advent season. It is a glorious time to remember, to remember that you chose to break into this world, to live among us, to understand what it is to be human with all the joys and all of the struggles and pain, that you chose to move in close to us so that we might know you, that we might understand your love for us, your compassion for us. We thank you, loving God, that during this season of Advent, we have the opportunity to remember again and to pause and, and wait expectantly for the arrival of the Christ child. Loving God, there are spaces in our lives where we're all waiting on something, waiting for an answered prayer, waiting for news, waiting for something that will give us hope. And I simply ask, loving God, that in this season, you will meet us once again. That we will find moments where we encounter you throughout this season, and that we are renewed in hope. Loving God, we lift up this church, this worshiping community, and we thank you that you are with us. We lift up this community around us. We are a world that is in constant need of you. We lift up the world that all sits and waits these days. A world that is hearing of a, a new variant, COVID variant. A world that knows a lot of pain and a lot of strife. A world that is aching and wounded and needing hope. Loving God, help us to be your people and may we bear the light that you brought to the world so long ago. Help us, Father God, to each and every day not hide that light, but to willingly bear it so all may see. And now together, by one Holy Spirit, we pray the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. stand for the hymn.
So who would you assume needs hope the most? Who needs hope? Would it be somebody who's sick, maybe struggling with an illness or a disease? Would it be maybe someone in prison? Maybe somebody who's just deeply lonely? We have a little bit of a little video I would like you to watch, and it kind of talks a little bit about who needs hope. I hope you enjoy this. So I think the thing that that video reminded me is that everybody needs hope. I mean, often we look at the young folks and you think, whoa, they are, they're healthiest. They have their whole life before us. So many possibilities. But the reality is that regardless of our age, we all need hope. It's universal. Everyone needs hope. During the Advent season, we are now moving in. We're starting a new sermon series um, called An Advent Journey of Hope. And each week, we're going to look for all those little spaces where we maybe experience sort of a heaven on earth moment where we encounter Jesus. Because we need hope in this season. And I want to begin this morning reading a scripture passage to you out of the book of Isaiah that is full of hope. In fact, it will be familiar to many of you. It's often read at Christmas time, and I think you will enjoy this because the words and the imagery are so beautiful. So I'm reading today out of Isaiah 9, verses 2 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in a pitch dark land, light has dawned. You have made the nation great. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with the joy at the harvest, as those who divide plunder rejoice. 
As in the day of Midian, you shatter the yoke that burdened them, the staff on their shoulders and the rod of their oppressor. Because every boot of the thundering warriors and every garment rolled in blood and will be burned fuel for fire. A child is born to us, a son is given to us, and authority will be on his shoulders, and he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be vast authority and endless peace for David's throne and for his kingdom, establishing and sustaining it with justice and righteousness now and forever. The zeal of the Lord of heavenly forces will do this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now that is victory language. That is hopeful language. In fact, it's military victory language of a people who have conquered those who have oppressed them. I don't think life could be any happier than to have gone to battle and to overcome those who mean you harm. And that's what this language is all about. And it's beautiful, and the imagery is outstanding. But I need to help you understand why and where it comes from and what it actually means. Because when you hear the story behind it, it becomes that much more powerful. Now, this comes from the book of Isaiah, which is a spectacular book written by a man named Isaiah, who was born back like in 70, 60 A.D. So this is an old book. And he was a, an average guy who was married with children and he served as a priest and one day he had a special calling god met him as he's doing his priestly duties in a spectacular vision where he saw the throne of god filling the temple and he was given his calling to be a prophet now normally you'd say whoa that's wonderful but i'm not so sure anyone ever wanted the calling of a prophet because to be a prophet was a really difficult job. Most of us, when we think of prophets, Old, time, Old Testament prophets, we think it's the person who, who basically by the power of the Holy Spirit speaks what's going to happen in the future. And sometimes that's true, and some of that applies to what we've read today. But more frequently, a prophet was called to speak the truth to the people in the present day, the truth they didn't want to hear. To go to a king and tell the king that he was out of line. To go to a people and say, straighten up. You have lost your way and you are no longer worshiping the way God asked you to worship. Your hearts have gone hard and cold and you've got to straighten up. No one wants that message, right? I'm pretty sure prophets were never invited to parties. I'm pretty sure no one wanted to hang around them. Because they spoke an uncomfortable truth. In the writing of this passage and these words of hope, it's really debatable when they were actually spoken, when they were, when they were spoken by the prophet. The prophet uses this beautiful imagery and poetry to speak hard truths. But this particular, these words of hope, there's a debate about when they were. Just to give you a little history, the nation of Israel at one point was divided into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And sadly, the northern kingdom was corrupt, and they did not obey God, and they were destroyed by the Assyrians. And there's some debate of whether this passage is talking about the destruction of the northern kingdom or the destruction of the southern kingdom that's coming. They will be overwhelmed by Babylon. The city will be destroyed. They will be dragged off to another place, and they won't return for many years. These words of hope are for a people who are in trouble, for a people who are facing some hard realities. They're not going to get out of those hard realities. They're going to live through them, and it's going to be difficult. And these words are going to hold them. The words come to them because they are going to need hope as they face what they are going to face. I, I don't like words that are... <laughs> We're, I want someone to tell me it's going to be okay tomorrow. I don't like waiting. And that, that's really what these words will be, words of waiting on hope. I would just like life to get better. Not so good on the waiting. In fact, when I think of hopeful things, often the phrase heaven on earth comes to me. 
it's kind of a strange little phrase that we do, something is heaven on earth. When my children were born, I could say that was a heaven on earth moment. Seeing those little babies and those little bodies and realize what a miracle was. That was a heaven on earth moment for me. But we also say a lot of other things are heaven on earth. A really good cup of coffee or a spectacular meal. It's a heaven on earth and then you post it, right? I mean, there's a lot of things we call heaven on earth, which is kind of funny because we don't even know what heaven on earth means. Because we don't know what heaven looks like. We don't have a clue. A couple weeks ago on All Saints Sunday, we talked a little bit about heaven and what it will feel like, but we didn't actually say what it will look like because we frankly don't know. Scripture tells us a little bit, gives us a few clues, but I'm going to be honest with you. As the years pass, the translations of Scripture get better and better, and often the way we used to translate stuff now has, has changed and is more accurate with what we have now. So many of you were taught things that were not, people would say, that's not quite so accurate anymore. Let me give you an example. Heaven on earth. What is heaven like? Well, John 14, 2 tells us that God has prepared a mansion for us in heaven. I remember hearing that as a kid who was sharing her bedroom with her younger sister, Lisa, who was a pain in the neck. And I was a yes, I will finally live in a big house and hopefully she won't be in the house with me. And I will have plenty of rooms and I will finally be the rich person I deserve to be. We were middle class, maybe slightly lower class. I'm not sure. But all I knew is I never had this the stuff I wanted. I wanted more clothes. And if surely if I'm living in a mansion, life will be good. Well, it turns out a better translation of that is not necessarily mansion, because with mansion, we all go to a very materialistic place, right? It's better to say a large house with many rooms, because this scripture is more about the abundant nature of God, the abundant love of God for all people. Like, you never have to worry, will there be space for me in heaven? You never have to worry, will it get too full? Will they run out? No. There's always a space for us in heaven if we desire Jesus. We don't have to worry will there be enough room because it's a mansion. It's a big house. The other thing that I was taught growing up comes out of the book of Revelation 2121, and it talked about the streets of gold. Now, the only reason I may have appreciated that because I lived in Michigan and the wintertime is pothole season. And so I'm pretty sure if there's streets of gold, you won't have a problem with potholes. We don't have that down here so much, but up north it's a serious problem. And, but other than that, really, why do we need streets of gold? But again, it was that opulence. I was thinking wealth, thinking wealth, when in reality, that's a symbol that most likely means complete or perfection. It's a very different image. We don't know what heaven looks like. But if I were to imagine what a heaven on earth moment here would be, I can do that one pretty easy in my head. A heaven on earth moment for me would be a place where I find forgiveness for all my junk, but I am also finally able to forgive some people who have hurt me who I have held on to for a long time. And I tried, but still was angry at them. A heaven on earth moment for me was when you can find healing. And I'm not just saying physical healing. Can you imagine that? A physical healing is amazing, but emotional healing. There's a lot of us people who struggle with stresses and you know things that bother us and to have that emotional healing where you feel whole. I mean, those are kind of the moments I think about when I think about heaven and on earth. And while we do glimpse spaces of healing and forgiveness, it's not yet complete. But there's some more really hopeful words in the book of Isaiah. A little later on in the book, in chapter 53, verse 5, these scriptures are also referencing the coming Messiah the hope of this Advent season. And I want to read that to you because this is the most hopeful words at all. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was pierced because of our rebellions and crushed because of our crimes. He bore the punishment, now listen to this carefully, that made us whole. By his wounds, we are healed. That is the ultimate heaven 
That is the ultimate space of hope. That's what every one of us need. But the reality is, is we live on this earth and we don't have that in completion. And the reality is, is that life is still pretty hard. Life hurts and disappoints and we struggle and we get discouraged. And we need hope. I like what the, the late Henry Nouwen said about hope because I just think this is, this is such important understanding of why we need hope, especially in this season. He said, hope makes you see God's guiding hand, not only in the gentle and pleasant moments, but also in the shadows of disappointment and darkness. Everybody has those spaces of disappointment and darkness. Yet hope helps you see God's hand in the middle of that. Hope helps you see that God hasn't given up on us or deserted us. Hope helps you see that God hasn't forgotten you. Because sometimes, frankly, you feel forgotten. You just do. When life's hard enough, you just feel like God dropped the ball. And you know what? If, if I wasn't a believer, I think that would be a hard thing for me to encourage somebody to believe that God has a guiding hand in our lives. But the reality is God has a, candy, a guiding hand in our lives whether we're believers or not. He loves all people. But even when you're a believer, you have a hard time seeing that guiding hand. You can be so distracted by all the difficulties of life that you can't see that guiding hand. So I want to help you learn how to recognize the movement of God. God is at work in all of our lives, and he's speaking to all of us, but for some folks, it's really hard to recognize his voice. So I want to give you a metaphor that hopefully will help you. And this metaphor is a metaphor to see how you recognize God's hand. And it begins with a kite. Can you imagine if you had a really nice kite in a nice windy day, and you want to go out and fly your kite? And so you find a field or a beach, and you begin to start running with the kite, hoping that a wind will catch it, and it kind of gets sucked up. And then it begins to fly and soar and move higher and higher and higher. You know how to fly a kite. And you just keep releasing more and more strain, letting out more and more strain. And it's fun, and you feel this accomplishment as it goes higher and higher, and you watch it in the sky. And other people come and stand next to you, and you just stare into the sky, watching your kite go higher and higher and higher. Before you know it, it can get so high that you can't even see it. But you don't panic. Because every once in a while, you feel a tug. That's the way of God. Every once in a while, you will feel a tug. And that's how you know God hasn't forgotten you. Let me give you some examples. This past Wednesday, you know, that's the day if you're the cook in the house that you prepare the meals. Unless your college-age daughter comes home and says, Mom, I still don't have a dress for graduation in two weeks, and we got to go now. And so I prayed, because I always pray about those things, because there's a budget and finding the right size, and I have tall, tall daughters, and finding the right length is a challenge. And we went out. And I felt the tug of God when we found the perfect dress. I know that seems silly, but it wasn't in the moment. And then there was a time more recently when I was really busy. I get very lost in whatever I'm doing. And suddenly out of nowhere, I have this, you were supposed to call this person. I was like, oh, oh shoot, I totally forgot. I was supposed to call them. And so I quickly call them. And I had no idea that they were in such a dark place and in such a bad place that moment. And when I called, I knew from the conversation that I was supposed to call. And I know my memory stinks. And that was the tug of God who reminded me, make that call. And then there was a moment about 10, 11 years ago, and it had been a bad Sunday. There had been sermons. There had been meetings. And I was leaving the church, and there was nobody left. And I was like, I've had it. I hate this ministry. This ministry stuff is so painful. Sometimes people are just mean. Sometimes it seems like you're, you're just 
doing your very best and all you're getting is grief. And I was like, seriously, time for a new career change. Walking out of that church all by myself, feeling so absolutely discouraged. And this guy that I knew but didn't know at all walks up to me, George, and says, hey, can I pray for you? That was the tug of God. And then there was that moment back when I was 18. My mom was battling breast cancer. My friends were away at college. And I was helping raise my younger brother and sister who were not appreciative. <laughs> and I was so overwhelmed and discouraged. And what nobody knew is I was really pretty much thinking a lot about how life's really not worth living. This is what life's like. And I had thought about how I could make my less life you know, less painful or end it. I mean, those thoughts were going through my head. You don't tell anybody those things when you're feeling it because your mom is sick and you're responsible. But I was thinking about those things. And then one day my mother's girlfriend shows up at the door, asks me to come out on the porch and sit with her because she wants to know how I'm doing. That was the tug of God. Do you know how many times I have not wanted to go to church? I mean, just because I'm a preacher now doesn't mean I wanted to always go to church. How many times I wanted to just stay home and, and relax and just didn't feel like thinking about God. And you get yourself out of bed and you go to church or you turn it on and you say, I'm going to worship. And then I felt the tug of God for the very thing I was discouraged about. You see, that is a heaven on earth moment. When God meets you in the midst of your trouble, not necessarily changing your trouble, but just reminding you he hasn't forgotten you. He loves you, that he is there for you. And that tug gives you the assurance you are not forgotten. This Advent season, I would like to say we are moving into a hopeful time. But let's be honest. <laughs> Our world is a mess. We're hearing about a new COVID variant. We don't agree on anything around the vaccines. Our government is so locked in that we can't get anything done. We're waiting daily on on a bunch of very important trials and the outcomes will shape and form our world. And we feel tense and we feel anxious and we feel worried and stress is at its highest. Kids are so have so much anxiety these days. It is a hard time to live, yet we can have hope in spite of it because of Jesus Christ. We and when we have hope, we will be able to see the guiding hand of God in our lives. And we will remember that we are not forgotten. I have an Advent prayer I want us to end with. I love this. And we're going to say it out loud together because this is how we need to walk into the season. You know, you're going to walk into the season and you're going to start really pretty quickly running because there's going to be tons to do. And you have to battle staying focused on what is the season is all about. So I want us to say this prayer out loud as a personal prayer each that we are going to walk into the season differently. We're going to be very intentional in keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus throughout the season. No matter how busy we are, we are going to keep our eyes fixed. Now the first slide you're going to see, I'm going to start us out. And I'll open us with this prayer. But then the, every slide thereafter, I want you to read with me. I want you to, we're going to read it together in unison. So the first slide, I'm going to read, and then you pick up with me in the next slide, okay? Lord Jesus, master of both the light and the darkness, send your Holy Spirit upon our preparations for Christmas. We who have so much to do, see quiet spaces to hear your voice each day. We who are anxious over many things look forward to your coming among us. 
We who are blessed in so many ways long for the complete joy of your kingdom. We whose hearts are heavy and seek the joy of your presence. We are your people walking in darkness yet seeking the light. To you we say, come Lord Jesus. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. No, sit, sit down. So, so Janice giving you a little exercise here. So, uh, we're in a, a season here, a unique season, because we just finished Thanksgiving, and we just went through a season of feeling how feeling how all blessed we are, uh, and it's the scripture says we're given every good and perfect gift by God, and just thinking about how wonderful we are, how what grateful we are for all the blessings we have. And the, the main point about this is that we don't hoard it for ourselves. We need to share it. We need to give it away, all the things we've, bl we've been blessed with. And now we're going to the season of Advent, where we're talking about the hope of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, uh, and the hope uh, into a world that is so in despair and so needs to hear it. So as a church, we need to be bearers of that. We need to be vessels of that message of Jesus Christ. So uh, they, the, that message can, can, can get out, the message of Jesus Christ coming to be with us, to be the light of the world, to show us how to live, to give us abundant life and eternal life. So we, we ask you now to be a part of that by helping, supporting the ministries of this church in a way by giving your tithes and your offerings. So during this next special music, we are asking you to, if you're here, 
uh, on campus, you can come forward and give your uh, offering here in the basket here or in the back, or you could do so on your way out. You can also uh, go online and give that way, but um, at samunc.life, you can text them, or you can even mail it in. So there's multiple ways you can give. But uh, we want you to enjoy this special music now. And if you are here uh, in, the, in the sanctuary, to come forward or to, to bring your, your, your tithes and offerings in the baskets. So thank you for your generosity. Even in the midnight of their living, the compelling messages of the prophets prompted Israel to prepare for the dawning of a new day when the Messiah would come. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. <laughs> your heads. Holy God of new beginnings, as we share our tithes and offerings with you, we are filled with hope. We entered the season of Advent with expectation. We have left behind us a time of fear, isolation, and uncertainty, and we raise our heads because we know our redemption is coming near. May our gifts be dedicated to help heal the brokenness of our world and to welcome our Messiah into the world once again. In Christ we pray, amen.
was so good to worship with you all today, whether you're at home or here in the building. If this was your first time to be with us, we're so happy to have you with us. Receive now this benediction. Go forth into this Advent season filled with the hope of Jesus Christ, who will continually show up in our lives, reminding us that we are loved. In Jesus' precious name, amen.